Okay, I think we can get started because I'm sure everybody's busy and has other things to do. So, Adrian, do you want to go ahead and discuss the goal of this and then we can go on? Sure. Um, so welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, the idea for today's webinar is just to um, present some of the basics about the research exchange portion of the Lorex program. Um, Adina is going to go through, she's got some slides that talk about some of the logistics, the application process, etc. Um, so she's going to go through that presentation and in the meantime, as questions come up, feel free to put them into the chat window. Um, what will happen at the end of Adina's presentation is I'll come back online and read through those questions. Um, we're cognizant there's a lot of people on the line and we don't want a lot of feedback by unmuting people. Um, but if it's your question, I can unmute you at the time. And then um, we'll just go from there. So yeah, thanks for your interest and I'll turn it back over to Adina. Perfect. Thanks, Adrian, and thank you all for joining us here for this presentation. Most of the information that I'll cover is also present on the web page, but I can, you know, this will provide us the opportunity to discuss a little bit more, provide a little bit more details, uh, and address specific questions as they come up. So, and all I wanted to start is by saying that we're really, really very excited at ASLO to have this program. It's a, called Limnology and Oceanography Research Exchange, and it's part of the International Research Experience for Students funded by the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation is, strives to support the development and global exchange and exchange between US scientists and international scientists and to provide students in engineering and STEM an experience that would make them a part of a global community of scientists. Um, and that's where ASLO and NSF joined, or ASLO proposed the program, the Lawrence program, to allow ASLO student members to implement international projects and provide them with the um, tools and practice that will help their future careers. Uh, it, I don't think we have that displayed clearly on the webpage, but the program was funded by the National Science Foundation for three years. So this is our first year, and that will be the one where we'll be learning along a lot through the process. Um, some of the reasons why ASLO was excited to apply for this program is because particularly in aquatic sciences, political boundaries and borders don't work very well. And their aquatic sciences is a very interdisciplinary and collaborative endeavor. And we really feel very strongly that students should have this kind of experience. And it's very much aligned with one of the goals of uh, ASLO, which is to enhance the participation of a diverse new generation of international scientists. Um, and we feel that this is needed to advance the aquatic sciences and the experience. So let me tell you a little bit about the IRIS program that I'm familiar with because I served on NSF panels for the IRIS program and had, was funded in the past to run a few of these programs before. Generally, the international research experience for students supports PIs or scientists to take a few students, typically from their own lab, from their own institute, to work with them in a foreign country. And as such, the students participate in the PI's research. And they do get to go overseas and help do, um, you know, experience collaborations, work overseas. But this is not really how the whole process or the full spectrum of the process of international collaborations. Because when you guys will become scientists, you won't have your advisor to tell you, oh, we're going tomorrow to Mexico or to Spain or somewhere else to do this, that, or the other job. Rather, you'd have to initiate, plan, 
think about the idea, apply for funding. So what the Lorex, Lorex program strives or wants to achieve is a more hands-on, bottom-up, student-driven experience. Obviously, you can't do it completely without the support of your advisors, but you will be involved and engaged throughout the process, from writing the proposal application, getting feedback from reviewers, designing your research, communicating, looking for collaborators or partners, communicating with them, and making sure that at the end you're achieving your goals. And obviously it won't be done in a vacuum because we don't expect you to necessarily know how to do all of that from the get-go, but we will be there to provide guidance and uh, help you with understanding how to be effective and successful in collaborating and doing international research. Um, so the goals of the research there is, or of the program, there are some research goals and some education aspects, obviously to carry out relevant research, cutting edge research that is relevant to oceanography and limnology. It will prove the program we hope to provide training in initiating, coordinating and executing such programs. Um, we want to give you the experience to, of participating in international research and functioning as part of a research team from again throughout the whole process from initiating the contacts through completion of the work and as again part of aslo's goal is to provide experience working in cross-cultural environments which is not necessarily trivial um, the program now i'm moving down to give a few more details about the program itself it has several different components uh, there's, there's obviously information on the web, but throughout the year we will have several webinars or workshops that are open to all ASLO uh, student members or non-student members who want to participate in that. We will announce them and they could join like you all are joining here online or uh, go to workshops that will be given during meetings. But in addition to that, to this uh, platform that's open to everybody, there's a, every year for the next three years, we will select a cohort of students that will participate in actual field research. And they will also receive special training at the ASLO meeting before they go to the field. So, I'll go more into details shortly about how you apply for that and what are the criteria for selecting people. But in addition, oh, after the ASLO meeting, those people will have more specific, more or less one-on-one on one training and resources available to them with the goal of helping them plan for their research. And then they, they, these students will actually get support for their travel and for um, lodging and a small living expense to go and conduct the research either in the summer which will be summer 2019 or in the winter which will the first run will be the winter of 2020 or end of 2019 beginning of 2020 depending on the sites um, obviously we because this is a learning experience, we want the cohort that participates on the first round to also um, provide from the, or share their experience with other students and um, you know do or participate in blogs or um, evaluations and so on. So we are hoping that it, the, the experience will not end in your a field work, but will go on later on with reflection and dissemination of the results. So to the program information details, because the program is funded by the US National F Science Foundation, whether we like it or not, the people or the students that will participate in the field component of the project are can only be those that are a graduate students in the U.S. program, but those that are also U.S. citizens or residents, 
and they have to be as low members because part of it, part of the process is to participate in these webinars and the whole process is run through ASLO, which is a good thing anyway to become an ASLO member. It's not very expensive and it's, you get a lot of benefits from that. And um, obviously because you are students, we expect that uh, you will get permission from your advisor to participate in that. We do not want students to have problems later on with their advisors because they disappeared for two months and left their research projects. And not only that, I think the advisor will be a good, or some other person that you work with will be a good uh, resource for you along the way as well. Um, so another requirement other than being citizen and ASLO member is that you must participate. Once you get selected for the program, you really are committed to participate in all of the components. You can't say, okay, I'm going to do the field work, but no, I don't want to present or share my experience, so I won't uh, post on the blog or won't respond to the evaluation. You have to really uh, participate in all of all of the aspects of the program and they're not too many of them so it's not going to be a huge time sink uh, the biggest component will be actually the summer or the field program whether it's in the summer or in the in the winter and um, how are we going to select the students it's going to be through a, a pathway that is similar to what happens when you really are a PI or a scientist and want to initiate collaborative research. First of all, you have to think of why is it that you want to do this uh, project, where, how, who are you going to work with, and then you need to get funding for it. Um, so that will happen through a competitive proposal that you write where you share the justification for the research, why is it important, how is it feasible to do it, what would they, why you want to do it at the specific site and with the specific collaborator, how would you benefit from it, how would the world benefit from it, and so on. And based on these, an ASLO committee, uh, including representatives from each of the host sites, will select the students. We are hoping that for each year, we can support about 30 students to go and do these, this research at the various locations. And it really would depend how many at each site and when would depend on the applications. So, so we expect that it will be distributed, but not necessarily evenly among sites. Um, in terms of the rubric, rubric for evaluation, it's about 20% or equal amounts for each of these evaluation criteria. Now this is the most important slide. Again, all of this information is also at the web page, but if you all are interested in also the field component, the research component, you have to pay very, you have to pay attention to the details here. The application is already online, is already open, and it will be open till the end of the month. And you must apply not by sending the application through email to anyone, but you have to do the application online through the ASLO webpage. Um, to do that, you have to identify a site of where you want to do to conduct your research, as well as a name of possible collaborators at that institute. Ideally, at this stage, you have already exchanged some emails with these potential collaborators because it's possible that, you know, they're on sabbatical this year and that's not a good time for you to go work with them. Uh, you want to know that they're interested. You want to know that they have time and that you want to share with these collaborators your proposals so they're aware of what's happening. So that would take some time and investment in thinking about your project and looking for the collaborators. Now, if you go to the uh, Lorex ASLO webpage, you can find a lot more information about each of the participating institutes, their facilities, their faculties, and more information about their, in, on their website about what type of research they're doing. Once you have an idea and you identify a, a site 
and the, and potential collaborators. Ideally, you might even get a yes, I'm happy to work with you, and not just potential, but actually committed collaborator at this stage. Uh, then you have to write your proposal. The proposal is fairly straightforward. Um, you have to write an abstract, only 300 words, which is a concise summary of what you're planning to do. Then the project description is limited to three pages and there are certain components that you have to include there. What problem you're addressing, what's the rationale for your word or objectives, a little bit of background, and definitely a work plan for your internship, which will, the work plan will determine the feasibility of your project because the program is designed to be a very focused experience. We cannot fund somebody to go to spend three years in a, a different institute. It's a focused research experience and it does have some flexibility. We expect most projects to be between four and eight weeks and that's based on the funding we have uh, so you know if you're we also would like most of the students if not everybody to start the pro program together because then you will receive an orientation and introduction to the site you don't have to end it all at the same time so students can return home a different times but ideally everybody goes together to the site gets orientation starts the program and then work with their collaborator at each site and that's where it's very important to plan your work you have to make sure that what you're planning fits within the four to eight weeks time frame that doesn't mean you have to finish the project you have to finish the field component of the project. You can come back to your institute with samples and continue analyzing them later if that's what the work entails. And then, of course, another important component is justification. And the justification is not, I would really like to dive in Australia or um, go on a cruise in uh, Canada. That's why I'm proposing to do the work there, but rather there must be some either resource, collaborator, technique, location, site spe specific um, that is unique to the host institute and or to your collaborator. So you justify why uh, we, ASLO and NSF, should invest in sending you to that specific location. And of course, uh, letter from your advisor indicating supporting this and indicating that they're okay with send with you going away for four or eight weeks or whatever the time frame is the final component is some references again limited to one page and in terms of timeline the as i said the application was started or is open since september 10th it will end in october this is now the September 28th information webinar. We will announce the people or the 30 uh, field students or people who got the fellowships to participate in the field component in November 22nd. And in December, we'll have another webinar that will be open to whoever wants to participate, but will be required for the selected students. Then between December and February, we will have some webinars about each site uh, provided by the host institutes, just like here, which again, students that participate at a specific institutes will be required to participate in the webinar and others can if they want to get, just get information for planning for next year. Um, during the ASLO uh, Aquatic Science meeting in San Juan, Puerto Rico, we, before the meeting on the Sunday, we'll have a half day workshop for the first cohort of students. Again, required to participate. We will cover your um, travel to come to Puerto Rico and we're some of the at least the registration for that uh, 
specific day, maybe more than that. So you can, since you're getting there anyway, um, you could participate in the rest of the meeting. We'll also have a town hall meeting during the, um, a town hall uh, open during the meeting to provide additional information. There will be representatives from each of the site. If you've already communicated with your a collaborator that would be, and they're planning to come, that will be a great place to get together and chat with them. And then after that meeting and throughout the spring, we'll have more one-on-one -on -one with students uh, every other week, a short online or through email planning and preparation session so we can make sure that you are on top of it and know what you're doing. And then there'll be one more seminar in the spring after we, and then during the summer with the first cohort will go to some of the sites. I think all of the sites are open for accepting students this summer, except for the sites in Israel, which will start in the winter, mostly because it's probably too hot to go there during the summer. Um, there will be another webinar in the fall of 2019, which for some of you, it will be after uh, you've participated in the summer or in the field experience, but we will cover these aspects before you go as well. Um, during or the whole experience, we will ask you to participate in social media, web, uh, a webinar, blogs, and so on. And then during the, the meeting a year after that, we'll have a session dedicated to the ASLO, oh, to the Lorex experience, and you will have the opportunity to share your experience, present either your work or your uh, lessons learned from this experience, not necessarily only the research, but also what were the challenges, what were the opportunities, how you benefited from that, and what you would uh, recommend for other people's to other potential students to do. In terms of expectations, as I said, participate in all of the activities. When you're at your host institute, you will be asked to either present a talk or a poster. So you people in that institute will know about what you're doing and about your project. There will be a formal evaluation of the program. So you will have to answer a questionnaire before you go and after you come back. And then again, as I said, contribute to various social media about your experience. And then the year after, participate in a special ASLO session dedicated to the topic. And then if be available to answer questions for the next cohort of students. And at the bottom, I put there because I think it's very, very important. You need to realize that we would be very, it's very important for us that you would be safe, that this all experience would be beneficial, but also safe. So we will make sure that you don't do silly things when you're um, participating in the work. You will need to have health insurance through your uh, university. And if you need help with that, if for whatever reason your university does not provide student health insurance, please let us know because we would make sure that you're covered. That's really important. Um, another important component is you have to realize your collaborators are scientists. They're very, very busy. They're all excited to work with you, but they're, you have to be respectful of their time. And if you set up a Skype call or something with them, make sure that you are responsible to be there and not expect that, uh, you know, they'll contact you. You have to initiate all of that. Few in, a little bit information about the partners. There are um, actually seven different programs at four countries. The reason these places were selected because they uh, have a lot of experience hosting international students and they cover a broad range of uh, areas and topics from freshwater and, uh, and marine sciences. 
diversity of research and opportunity, and they were all very excited to participate in this program. So there's uh, two marine stations in Australia. They're both, or and in one of them, it's two separate sub programs. They're all uh, associated with the Southern Cross University in Australia. In Canada, it's Dalhousie University in Halifax, and there it's a very big oceanography department. So there's a lot of different aspects of oceanography. Two labs in Israel, one uh, along the Mediterranean and one in the Red Sea with different research focuses. And um, the um, science research station at Ume University in Sweden, where they have climate impact research, and that has both um, aquatic or limnological and terrestrial aspects. The others have some limnology, but are more focused on oceanography. Again, in terms of research activities at the host institute, you can find anything from fish ecology to molecular biology to neurobiology of certain organisms to climate change research. So a broad area. I honestly could not think of any other aspect that is not covered by this whole spectrum of groups there, including even technology and instrument development and things like that. So the next few slides, you can find all of this information on the web. I just wanted to summarize it here. And the slides are ordered based on the start dates for each program. So the program in Halifax in Canada, they'll start, though the students will go there sometimes in May. We did not decide on a specific date in May yet because we want to first know where the students are all coming from and when your school year ends. So it doesn't conflict necessarily with your school year if possible, if that's an issue. Um, there's the web page and you can read a lot about the various sub-disciplines that are covered there, but basically it's a very large oceanography department that cover biological, geological, chemical, and physical oceanography, including some innovative technology and so on. In the, the programs in Australia, there's the National Marine Science Center, and over there the focus is more on um, adaptation, resilience, and ecosystem and resource management. So it's more the human marine interactions um, and related to ecosystems and human resilience in the coastal zone. The second program there is the Marine Ecology Research Center and the work there is focused and both of them, all the programs in Australia We'll have students starting in June and in January. They're not uh, limited to a certain season or time. Uh, and in the Ecology Research Center, the work is on corals, whales, dolphins, marine pollution, and fisheries. There's some, they have a very nice aquaculture group as well and biodiversity. And the third center is the Biogeochemistry, Coastal Biogeochemistry Center. And again, here it's about eutrophication, ocean acidification, climate change, greenhouse gases, hypoxia, and so on. So it's more um, biogeoscience, but with aspects that are relevant to climate change and human components. Um, in Sweden, our center, uh, oh, will, the students will start in mid to late June, again, because of the site and when people are available there. And at that site, there is interdisciplinary research focused on limnology, climate change, with focus obviously on aquatic and terrestrial Arctic ecosystems. And one of my students did, did a project there and she really highly praised the site and the location. And again, you, you could hear more about that as we go and, stu and the representatives from each side can share more about the locations. Um, in Israel, one of the pro 
projects in the Mediterranean is at Haifa University. And again, they have an oceanography, school of oceanography that has um, four or different programs. Two are more traditional, marine biology and geoscience, although the geoscience, they have a lot of focus on resources, petroleum, seismics, and so on. And then they have two other unique uh, programs. One is marine archaeology or maritime civilizations, and the other is technology, and that's more development of instrumentation and, and so on for marine technology. And then the last one is in the Red Sea in Eilat. And this is an inter-university institute. So PIs there belong to different universities. And it's basically a marine station where people from all over the world come to do work. A lot of the advantages of that site, one is coral reef research, but also because it's on the Rift Valley, you can get to very open oligotrophic waters within half an hour from the site. So you can do a lot of open ocean research nearby. So it has that advantage as well. And with that, I think we're ready for your questions. Adrian probably is assembling all the notes you've been uh, writing and we'll go ahead and... Sure. Um... So I'm gonna go. Adrian, before you go, at the bottom of this slide, you have my email and Adrian's email. And if there's anything that we, you still have that is not covered or something that is personal that you don't want to share and you still want to ask, feel free to email us. We're both very responsive and we will answer your question through email as well. Yeah. Okay, um, we had a few questions over the chat. Um, there were questions about start and end dates for the summer program um, and specifically Canada, which I think um, was addressed. Let me unmute, um, let's see. Um, if the person, sorry, it's just initials um, who asked that, I just unmuted you. Um, if, did you, um, was your question answered or did you wanna follow up? Yes, the question was answered. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and I'd just add um, part of the, the complication, and Adina addressed on this, with setting the dates is we do want to make sure that this is a, a group experience, um, that the, the peer aspect of this is very important because it's about collaboration. And so ideally, once the cohort is selected, we'll be able to find a start date so that everybody starts around the same time um, the host institutions are going to do orientations and other activities to kind of get you oriented. So that's why the dates aren't like set in stone yet. Um, let's see, there was another question um, from Molly. James, um, what level of grad students is Lorex program looking for? Um, I'll take a stab and then turn it over to Adina. I think it really, um, oh, and Molly says she doesn't have a mic. Okay. Um, I think it's really more that we're looking for the right fit that someone has a good project idea and that this is right for them more so than where you're at in your program. Um, Adina, do you want to respond? Yeah, I, again, in past programs that I run that had similar experiences, we had students that were in their first year of their master's or PhD that wanted to learn a new technique that they didn't have available at their institute. So their collaboration influenced the rest of their thesis or they needed to collect samples that were unique to a certain location and then they brought them back and the rest of their thesis was built along these samples. So if you have a justification and you know what you wanna do and it's feasible to do it, it doesn't matter if it's your first year or your last year. Another student that um, you will probably meet if you get selected and come to ASLU that is going to share, she was actually in her fifth year. She was almost done, but had an idea of expanding or applying what she did for her thesis in, in another site. So she wrote a proposal to um, use knowledge she already had, methods she already 
developed as part of her thesis at another site and location. So it could be a whole range, just depending, like Adrian said, on how you justify the need to do that and how it will contribute to your personal development. And this is, again, what happens in real life. It's not like, okay, I'm taking a class to work with me on some topic that is my idea, but rather it's your idea, your needs, your initiative, your work of identifying and communicating with a collaborator. Does that make sense? Um, he doesn't have a- You don't have a mic, but right, so yes. Hopefully yes. he does. Added. Yes, it makes sense. Okay, great. Um, the other question that came in over chat was about the program dates, whether they're firm and can be shifted slightly. Um, I think I just addressed that. Um, we're going to, we're going to do our best. Um, and I think, yeah, those, those dates probably won't get firmed up. Adina, tell me if I'm wrong until after the cohort. We select, yeah. Selected. Once the cohort is selected, we'll do our best to accommodate people with the idea that we do want this to be a cohort experience. So we'll try to at least have a start date at each site that fits most of the people. And if for whatever personal reasons you're getting married on that day, we won't make you come and miss your wedding or something similar. So you can join a day before or day after. That's fine. But ideally, we would try not to have that. It's not that everybody can go anytime they want. Right. That's why we're trying to schedule the programs during the summer when there's no classes in most universities and during winter break where, again, there's less classes or there's semester, the, spring, the winter semester break is more or less at that time. So at least if you have to miss a couple of classes, you won't miss too much. So that's all that's come over. Um, if anybody, oh, here we go. Uh, from Hannah. Um, ideally, the research would complement our thesis, correct? Um, Adina, I think that was Yes, it. that's correct. Um, it doesn't have to be a chapter in your thesis necessarily, but it's something you will benefit from, something that will either contribute to your thesis, is somewhat related, is a new tool you're going to learn. Um, something that will contribute to your career in general, even if it's not specifically to your thesis. So it can be a side project that's relevant. Now, the reason I'm saying related to your thesis is you do want to have the blessing of your advisor to participate. So I assume, and I may not be correct there, that most of your advisors would not be excited to have you disappear for two months if you're not doing something that will contribute to your education, either directly to your thesis or to your future plans or to a side project that they're also interested in. Which brings me to another um, question that was raised that uh, one of the students sent me an email about, and that's about funding of the research. Our budget will cover your travel expenses, and living stipend at the host institute. We cannot provide money to cover all of the expenses related directly to your research because that could be a lot of money and vary from one person to another. We can also, we can help you if you'd like to write little grants to raise more money. I can come up with ideas of where you can apply for that, but that's where your investment and your university and advisor should come in and your collaborator because they might be as interested as you are in run in doing this uh, work. Um, so um, Hannah's follow up here, um, which might be important to address, how did, how would we handle if someone proposed something that's brand new to, you know, learning a new skill to expand their skill set are, mm -hmm. are be open to those kinds of applications. If the advisor's okay with it. Absolutely. So for example, if your work focuses say on data collection or doing some analysis and you want to add a modeling component, which is a new tool that you don't have experience with, 
uh, relevant to what you're interested in, your advisor uh, supports that and you want to go and do learn how to do some modeling or learn a new technique or something that expands your, it's anything that will prepare you for your future career as an internationally engaged scientist. Great. Um, okay, any other questions? Could funding cover travel to a field site from the, heel, from the host university? Um, meaning if you are going to Canada and you need to go somewhere else, yeah. or from Halifax to British Columbia? Um, here, um, I will unmute you. Um, Clara, Hannah, um, can you um, expand on that? So the, the project that I am talking to a collaborator about would involve traveling to New Zealand from Australia. Uh, Is that something that would be covered? I would have money for my university to cover that. Yeah, I I'll think what we... Collaborator. What we would cover would be your travel to the host institute in Australia, in this case, and living expenses there. Now, if you don't spend your living expenses there, that may cover some of your living expenses in New Zealand. But if your proposal says, okay, I'm going to Australia and I'm working with this person, this is my collaborator, and together we think that we want to compare, say, stuff in Australia to something in New Zealand and then you and your advisor and collaborator can get additional resources to cover an extra flight back and forth to New Zealand. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, would that funding be from ASLO as well through this program or would it have to come from a separate grant? It would, the actual travel, you can use whatever your living expenses, your small amount of money that is for your living. If you don't use it in Australia, you can use some of it to do an excursion to New Zealand, but it won't be as part of your travel back and forth. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so you mentioned the program's four to eight weeks. What determines whether it's four versus eight? Do we select based on how much time we need for the research? Um, exactly, yeah. You know, if, if, the, if you can, don't need more than four weeks at the site and you can finish your whatever you need to do in four weeks, we expect that that would be more or less the minimum needed, but a... Um, if you need more time, it could be up to eight weeks. So it really depends on specifically your uh, project. Yeah. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Can't see if anyone's typing. Um, oh, here we go, Hannah. If you have a project in mind that can work at either of two locations, how do you suggest we proceed? Uh -huh. Okay, that's a good question. And in my opinion, the way I would handle it is try to contact collaborators at each site and see which person that fits best is available, excited, excited to host you, um, you get along with, responds fast to your emails. That's how I would go about it if I were to initiate a collaboration and it could, you know, I'll give you an example. When I just started my career, I wanted to work on mangroves. So there's mangroves all over the world. And I thought, okay, I am going to contact people in Mexico and in the Philippines and see who, re who is interested in working with me, who can facilitate my needs. And then based on send emails around to different institutions, once I got responses, I made the decision and went with that. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can do it in multiple places, 
start by contacting people and figuring out where, where, who has the best, the more resources, time, team available to work with you? Yeah. I would say, though, too, I, I think there'd be advantage in noting in your application that you could work in one of two locations. Um, Correct. In case, you know, we do have limitations based on each site, what kind of housing is available, how many people can go. Um, I don't know that we're going to hit that cap, but I also don't see a harm in saying, hey, I, I could also do it here if this doesn't work. Particularly, you know, if we have no person going to one site at a certain deadline and a lot going to the other site, it might be, we might want to either split it so it's not too crowded in one place versus another or the opposite, want to have this cohort experience so not one person goes and spends time alone at the, at the location. Um, any other questions? To initiate contact with someone in a non-English location, is it rude to assume they'll be able to read an all-English email? For all of these countries, yes. Um, at, no, it, but it's not rude to assume. Oh, but no, not at all. Not no, rude. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, no, what no, I meant no. to say that the scientists in all of these institutes publish in English, write in English, and commute, they can communicate in English. That was one of the considerations of selecting these sites. Yes. Um, okay. Um, anyone else? We're, it looks like we're knocking up on an hour here. Um, I think I'll wait a little bit to see if there are any other questions, but um, I don't. I don't want to put David on the spot, but I think one of our collaborators from Sweden is on the line. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, David, um, and I am gonna put you on the spot, sorry. Um, David, do <laughs> you wanna talk about EMEA just for a few minutes um, in case anyone's here um, interested? Oh, we don't hear David. Okay. Maybe he's not. Oh, oh goodness. Sorry. <laughs> it is later there, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. So we will not be hearing from David unless we want to hear from his baby as well, apparently. So, um, okay. Uh, any parting thoughts, Dina? Anything else? I think, you know, with that, you've got information. Think about it. My advice is Start contacting, if you're interested in applying, start contacting potential collaborators sooner. When you have an idea and a first draft, share it with your collaborators so they know what, you're, what to expect and they can provide feedback. The more you work at the front end to set up the collaboration, the easier the process is going to be. So I would encourage all of you to not wait till after you get the, you know, get selected to participate to look for collaborations, but rather look for that sooner and start now contacting people. I know that David said that he, that at, uh, in Sweden, they already had two students contact the different PIs at the Institute. I heard that in Canada, they had a couple of contacts. Um, one person told me that they've contacted someone in Australia. So there's things are moving along, but do contact your collaborators early. There, it's they should all have heard about the pro the project, but just in case, you know, maybe it was announced in some faculty meeting and people were not present or were not there. Introduce yourself. Uh, send them the link to the program. Give them the name of the contact person in their institute for that program in case they want to check for more details with the local contact person and explain that, you know, you're, you are interested in collaborating, you will be coming probably during this time frame. This is what you're interested in working in, um, that how their expertise fit and explain that it's 
like any other collaboration with any other scientist. Uh, if they want to ask or communicate with your advisor and that's okay with you, you can introduce that as well. Yeah. And also just to reiterate what Adina said earlier in the webinar, this is the, the first of three years. Um, so for some reason, this year doesn't pan out. The, any effort you put in now may not be for, for nothing. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, we're, we'll be learning a lot on our end as well this year with the application process and, and helping to facilitate these collaborations. And hopefully by next year, all those collaborators will have heard of, of the program. So um, yeah, hopefully that end of things moves smoothly and, you know, whatever we can do on our end, I think as well, you know, we're happy to help people. Um, Okay, I have not seen any new questions come in. And if any of you want to talk to students who have participated in a similar, much more smaller scale program, let me know and I can put you in touch with some of my previous students who have done something similar. Not identical because they all came from the same institute, not the same department, but the same institute, but they did experience this whole process to some degree. And they all will be at the next ASLO to share their experience. Okay. Um, barring any questions coming in, I think, um, I hope this was helpful for everyone. Um, Adina and I, our emails are on the ASLO website. Um, you're welcome to reach out and contact us and thank you for attending. Thank you and hope that you're to read all your applications soon.